The long-term destructive power of landmines, most countries agree they should not be used. So why do some still manufacture and deploy them? And in an ever more online world, is there still a role for human intelligence and the craft of espionage? I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. The number of people killed or injured by landmines and similar weapons reached a 10-year high in 2015, while clearance funding hit a 10-year low. Well, that's according to a new report from the international campaign to ban landmines, who found that civilians made up more than three quarters of victims, and 38% of them were children. The only countries where government forces planted landmines in 2015 were Myanmar, North Korea, and Syria, none of which have signed up to the International Mine Ban Treaty. The Ottawa Treaty, or Mine Ban Treaty, became international law in 1999. It prohibits the use, stockpiling, production and transfer of anti-personnel mines. When the treaty was opened for signing in 1997, it garnered 122 signatures. Let us say to all the children of the world that you will walk again through the fields and climb the trees in the forest in the world free of mines. Currently, there are 162 states parties to the treaty. Of those, there are 34 UN states that are non-signatory, including China, the US and Russia. Between October 2015 and October 2016, there was no verified new usage of landmines among countries who are bound to the treaty. IEDs are the anti-personnel mine of choice for armed militant groups. They're quick and easy to make and can be as deadly as any mass-produced military-grade alternative. And due to the rise in militant insurgencies in Africa and the Middle East, the number of non-state armed groups using these weapons far exceeds the number of countries. 2015 saw a steep increase in the number of deaths and injuries resulting from these devices. Casualties rose 75% from 2014, due in large part to escalating conflicts in countries like Syria, Yemen, Libya and Ukraine. The majority of casualties were not military forces. The primary risk with these devices is that once a conflict is over, they linger on the battlefield and are detonated by returning civilians. In 2015, civilians accounted for 78% of casualties. Of these, approximately 38% were children. Many countries that have agreed to the ban suffer from lack of resources and struggle to improve the lives of victims. As a result, civilians who survive a landmine explosion are left with inadequate care and treatment. To discuss that further, I'm joined by one of the founding members of the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, a Nobel Peace Prize medalist as well, Lou McGrath. Um, Lou, you've seen people, you've talked to people who've actually been injured as a result of these devices. Yes. It's harrowing, isn't it? It is. I mean, landmines uh, don't just take away limbs, but they also destroy people's ability to work. Uh, they in some countries it's very difficult for those survivors uh, just to go about their normal everyday life uh, it's it can affect the way people view uh, those people in certain countries so most people and i think we can make this it's not a generalization it's an accurate statistic most people most countries believe these things are bad they should be banned they should be cleared up where they exist why do you think a few countries do not agree with that idea? Well, there's all sorts of different reasons why uh, countries haven't signed up to the treaty. I'm sure a lot of them will say that they still need to protect their borders, that they're still a valid um, a weapon. Uh, and, of course, it's not just countries, because non-state groups have also been uh, involved in planting landmines. I mean, the work of the ICBL, when you look, 162 countries have signed up to that treaty. We have 35 countries still to, 
to sign and ratify that treaty, uh, but we're making headway. I don't think anyone thought it would happen overnight, but one thing we do know, that that weapon has been uh, made to be something of a pariah. They're still being made, though, aren't they? They st still are, as far as we know, being made in certain countries. Where are they made? Uh, we do know that in Pakistan ordnance factories, we do know that there are uh, countries which are, are still involved, such as Myanmar, uh, but also, apart from those countries that are making them, there's huge stockpiles around the world uh, that have moved from country to country. Now, this obviously is illegal now, but in the 1980s, when a lot of those landmines were shifted over to Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, yeah, that was the biggest problem. And if you go and take the argument and say, OK, we agree, don't we? We're not going to use landmines. We agree we're not going to make any more. That's the official yes. view, if you like, the world view. Yes. And local governments say, and you say to them, well, hang on, you've got to load, you know, you've got to load in, a, in, in a warehouse down there. Get rid of them, blow them up, destroy yes. them. What do they say to you? Uh, well, of course, they're, they're bound under the treaty uh, to actually destroy all their stockpiles. That's what they should do. That's what they should in do. In practice, what are they doing? Uh, well, some countries claim that it's difficult for them to, you know, in places like Sudan, when we talk about stockpiles, they're spread around the country in isolated areas. These conflicts that have gone on for 30, 40 years, it's very difficult to see where all those stockpiles are. Uh, very little notes. There's taken. no record taking? Record taking okay. has been very bad in some countries. And where they have been deployed and actually placed in the ground, that's a nightmare job, the clearing up of that, because it's yes. painstakingly slow, isn't it? It is painstakingly slow. Uh, and in some ways, this is a big problem for clearance agencies uh, who are consistently trying to get more money to carry, continue the clearance. But you can understand that governments who've been contributing large amounts of money over the years uh, are wondering when it's all going to come to an end. We need to think about using more technology, developing better technologies to speed up the process. Like what? What would help? Uh, well, we have technologies that maybe uh, add to just what is pure metal detection. We have ground penetrating radar, which would guarantee that what you were looking at was a mine and not just a piece of metal in the ground. This would verify what the metal detector is saying and therefore give you a speedier way of clearing up not just metal in the ground, but actually clearing up... But the I suppose ground. even with that kind of diagnosis and mapping technology... Yes. You've still got to get a human being in there to, what, dig that thing out without it exploding? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, and that's the, the price we've had to pay for the uh, 40, 50 years we planted landmines, we made them. Uh, we made them in a lot of the Western countries as well as the Eastern countries. And unfortunately, some of the poorest countries... Uh, are those that are blighted with these landmines and we owe them a debt because if you don't clear landmines now the only way to clear them is either to stand on them or clear them safely that means we're leaving a legacy for future generations of children who are not born yet and there's no deterioration to these things is there if they're in the ground they will still remain lethal what for decades yeah well many of these mines that were made in the 60s, 70s, 80s were made of plastic. We all know how long plastic carrier bags last when they're thrown away and disposed of in the sea. Uh, that they, they, a hundred years is probably just on the uh, lower side of how long a landmine will stay active in the ground. So how do you try and persuade people who may be finance directors of governments and countries and so on have got all sorts of pressures on them to try and keep economies going. This, while being a worthy cause, is another headache for them. Do we still give a bit of money? How do you try and make that argument that says you should prioritise this? Please keep this work going. Well, it's stability as well. Uh, part of the problem in a lot of the countries is the lack of ability to carry out a normal everyday life, to grow your own food, that we continuously give aid, have to give aid to countries who uh, lack the facilities, the, the, the uh, 
uh, areas to grow their own food. Is, land, is that amount of land really seriously a significant amount? If it was returned to agriculture, for instance? If it was make returned a... to agriculture, it could have a huge impact in, in a lot of countries. It, what about the security of, the, of borders, though? Because although these things were deployed in the first instance because they were a relatively cheap way of protecting an area, weren't they? And that remains the case. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure that it, if someone wanted to invade a country that landmines would actually stop them. Not It'd an invasion, slow them but down. maybe just yes. human traffic across human a, a bit Human traffic of across borders. Are we saying that we want to lay landmines to stop human traffic? I'm not sure that that's what most, uh, you know, human beings would want to see done to their fellow man. But you... I admire your optimism because here you are, you're soldiering on with this argument and yet I can see that funding is shrinking yes. and the job is not done. That, yeah, it well, must be difficult to remain cheerful about this project. Well, I, I now work for an organisation set up by Sir Bobby Charlton, a former uh, uh, English footballer, uh, who saw the devastation caused by landmines and he wanted to find a better way of clearance and that's where he's taken this organization now into looking at developing those new technologies by funding universities to actually uh, develop new methods of clearance. So the role that the task ahead may get simpler if some of this research yes. bears fruit. Yes, uh, and, and if, if, if governments start to see the process speeding up in the way of clearance, and there is an opportunity there for us to actually get to the point of saying, we can do this, we can put every effort into it with better technology, then I think governments will not feel as downhearted as they are feeling now. Lou McGrath, good to talk to you. Thank you for being here. And you, thank you. This is Insight, coming up. A decade after the murder of Alexander Litvinenko, we examine the state of modern espionage.